In an age where seemingly everything has become political, and correspondingly almost every user on social media adapts and maintains an outwardly pseudo-intellectual persona with near-religious fanaticism. I'm sure all of us at some point have, if only for a passing fleeting fancy, imagined sitting down behind the Roosevelt desk in the Oval Office as the President of the United States. And now you can, albeit in virtual satirical form, in This is the President. This is the President is a largely text-based strategy game, one that combines a number of varying elements, such as resource management, multiple-choice text responses that provide positive, neutral, and negative outcomes, time management, and permadeath. If one were to merely direct a superficial glance at it, it would seem like any other text-based, story-driven game. But the more you play it, the more that additional gameplay mechanics start to roll out to the point where there is so many things to get done in a single in-game day that you have to learn to make serious choices about which you commit to and which opportunities you choose to pass off. Your character was elected in 2020, and your primary goal throughout the duration of your illustrious and redoubtable presidential career is passing Constitutional Amendment Number 28, which would prevent any serving or former president from facing prosecution for any crimes that they committed by granting them lifetime immunity. I need hardly comment that there are probably more than a few good reasons why we don't have this kind of thing in real life, but that's your presidential prerogative. The problem is that on a day-to-day -day basis for you and your administration, there's a lot of other stuff that gets in the way, namely being Congress and the media. The satirical representation of American politics doesn't end with the president simply being morally bankrupt and legally liable, but American political media outlets get pretty well roasted here too. While I was busy trying to cure cancer, an Inauguration Day promise from my character, the media started spinning a ridiculous story that I was secretly using my federally funded cancer laboratories to instead create biological agents to organize the mass extinction of media reporters and political rivals that were daring to question my administration. While that sounds like a hilariously awesome idea for gameplay, sadly this was not even remotely accurate, and the media only got more ridiculous from that point onward which made press conferences and public speeches really fun to pull off as a player. I love the PR-related gameplay elements featured here, even if they were a bit minimalistic in both design and in terms of the general UI. Because your ability to pass key pieces of legislation, namely Amendment 28, as well as other more typical pieces of congressional legislation you may have publicly committed to in a State of the Union or other public speeches, is contingent on you maintaining high public ratings, as well as having many distinct forms of financial income and winning key people over to your side. You have to be at least somewhat aware of all this when you talk to the public. You don't want to be perceived as an uncertain bungler, or on the other hand, as a quintessential empty-handed bloviator. You want to appear strong, but not too strong. You want to be perceived as being open to the voice of the American people, but not so dependent that you can't be trusted to get anything done independently. It's all about finding that much-desired, much-coveted balance. One of the problems with the gameplay is that while it sets up this excellent premise of you being the president, and you have a definitive end goal, and you have to respond to certain other scripted events along the way, it doesn't really let you pursue your own executive agenda outside of that. If you're going to present a obvious roleplay premise for your game, why not allow the player to actually embrace that a bit more fully? And this is where I think the core underlining problem resides with the This Is The series, whether it be This Is The Police or now This Is The President. While a certain degree of structured hand-holding is required because of the kind of game that these games are, because you want the player to follow those story beats in a timely fashion and feel those constant varying degrees of stress associated with that ticking clock, but you don't want to lose that more free-flow fun of putting the player into that exalted office and seeing what they do with it. For a game called This is the President, the majority of the time I spent in-game, I felt less like the President of the United States and more like I was occupying the role of White House Chief of Staff, whose primary responsibilities are to enact the President's agenda and to supervise the West Wing White House staff. I felt like I was spending more time and energy babysitting the day-to-day -day needs of the White House staffers and overlooking the payroll expenses than I spent serving the goddamn needs of the American people. I spent more time enacting presidential agendas than actually creating and deciding upon them. Because the game does not give you these kinds of choices, at best it's usually a telltale like pick one of these two meaningless choices type options, where all you'll do is maybe you change a few lines of dialogue here and there during the PR interactions. For a game that's supposedly all about choice, it damn well does not like giving you actual meaningful choice. If the developers want to go on to make a sequel, and I hope they do, I hope they scrap the shoehorned in story elements, which at no point even remotely add anything worthwhile to the experience. At no point, mind you. 
Within a minute of sitting down through the first comic book style cutscene, I was already bored out of my mind and it only went downhill from there. It's not that the story is badly written per se, at least not in the traditional sense. It's just incredibly repetitive and tedious. What could be conveyed in a single two minute long introductory cutscene is hopelessly repeated and elaborated on again and again and again in an excessively pontificating manner over the course of many separate cutscenes, all beginning basically with the same variation of as you know. As my intro to screenwriting professor used to say way back, never begin anything with as you know. If we already know it, you don't have to say it. If the amount of time and effort that went into including all these individual cutscenes was instead reallocated towards fleshing out the core gameplay, we probably could have had a far more polished experience than we ultimately got. Speaking to that last point, what really pisses me off though, not that I've been pissed off at any point up till now, is how the UI focuses so hard on minimalizing everything to keep it clean that it often leaves out crucial bits of information that have a direct corresponding effect on gameplay. For one, your staff can and will get burnt out if you work them too hard. There are only a set number of actions that they can take in a row before you have to send them on vacation until the beginning of the following month so they can recuperate. Now, setting aside the real-life ridiculousness of imagining senior White House staffers taking week-long or month-long breaks during any four- or eight-year-long administration, what bothers me is that even if you give them these regular breaks, they'll still inexplicably burn out and either quit or kill themselves. I'm not even joking there. I got a Steam achievement during my first playthrough where one of my senior staff, my legal consultant, I believe, decided to, shall we say, hang around permanently and become a ceiling decoration. Morbidly amusing as that was, it was also very frustrating because that character literally spent more time on vacation than working, and still complained that I was working him too hard. There was also a weird bug where despite me clicking the checkmark box to approve everyone's salaries at the end of the month, they would then immediately complain to me about me refusing to pay them even though the appropriate amount of money was being transferred from my accounts. I had to replay a month because someone quit after not being paid despite me having paid them. Related to that, specifically regarding financing and UI, every now and then people will ask you for an increase in their salary, which in of itself is fine and something you'll see a lot in these managerial type simulator games. The problem here is that they'll always, or almost always, demand an ungodly, unimaginable, drastic increase in salary. I had one person demand their salary be increased from $28,000 a year to $420,000 a year. And this wasn't even part of a promotion to a higher rank, this was just them wanting more money in the bank. Not only that, not only was this not them pitching it to me at random, but they were actually threatening to leave unless I meet said demand. If you're going to have this mechanic play out, either make the proposed increases at least somewhat reasonable, or allow for a bit of back and forth haggling. I cannot even begin to think of a reason why the White House press secretary warrants a higher salary than the President of the United States himself. When I play Two Point Hospital, a top-down managerial game I absolutely recommend to anyone with a dry sense of humor, I love it so much I own it on both my PC and my Nintendo Switch, and a subordinate comes to me in that game with a salary increase request, say going from 48000 to 60000 I can decide whether or not to approve the entire amount, deny it outright, or pick a number somewhere in between those two. The higher the increase, the happier the employee, and vice versa with the lower end. This is the president here makes that process far too arbitrary and excessively punishes the player for not constantly meeting employee demand. Consequences in the game are good and often are necessary, but this delves so far into the deep end of questionable balancing that it's hard to see it as anything other than a poorly baked gimmick in desperate need of refining. The lack of financial negotiation mechanics also comes into play when you have to bribe certain senators which you'll have to do every now and then to smooth things over when it comes to small congressional matters like impeachment and conviction hearings, of course. I know I've spent quite a bit of time here criticizing the card-based management of senior staff, but there is at least one component of that which the game somehow manages not to screw up, at least mostly. That being how you organize your staff. Certain key positions have to be held by candidates with certain temperaments and skill sets, otherwise you're not going to get the most value out of those people in those positions. Every staff member provides certain active or passive buffs, and the better suited they are to the position you aim to put them in, the better those buffs will be. You'll have the opportunity to preview those buffs before you make the final decision whether or not to place said person in that role. These can range from static financial income increases at the beginning of every new month, a passive percentage-based deduction in what you'll pay in staff salaries at the end of each month, a flat increase in how many actions a staff member can take before requiring a vacation, a boost in staff happiness, slowing the rate at which your staff members will resign or kill themselves, all of which can be desirable qualifications for a job post. 
If the person isn't well suited to the role you're about to place them into, you'll get only one minor buff, but if they're well suited to it, you'll probably get two, and one of them likely will be quite a big one compared to the other. It's a very well designed system, but it feels like it was designed for a far broader assortment of potential candidates, where you actually have to take into consideration before hiring them whether their skill sets match a opening in your office. But realistically, more often than not, you're forced to put any live body in there until someone better comes along, at which point you swap them out with no consequences. It's basically the in-game equivalent of that meme template of the guy walking in the street with his girlfriend and she sees him checking out another girl and is rightfully jealous and annoyed. I'd imagine that's how my subordinates feel when I shuffle them around, demoting people in favor of new people. But you'll never know because when you demote people and free sign them, it does not result in any new dialogue for them, nor does it appear to have any impact either way on their likelihood or not likelihood to resign. For all they are complaining about being placed in a stressful position, they never seem all that relieved when you move them out of said position. This of course goes back to my earlier point about the lack of clear communication, to the point where several of the core gameplay mechanics don't gel at all together, and instead come into conflict with one another, which is not a sign of good game design. I was very surprised to hear that while you can appoint White House senior staff members, positions which in the grand scheme of things aren't in of themselves very prominent, you never actually get to appoint any cabinet members, and thus you never get to oversee them handling the specifics of your agenda. Why the fuck should I care about managing the day-to-day -day affairs of the White House press secretary when I could be consulting with and managing executive cabinet members like the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Agriculture, the Secretary of Labor, the Secretary of Education, and so on? When it comes to all regulatory matters concerning domestic and foreign policy, those are the positions that the president would want to be heavily invested in appointing the right people for not who should be the new press secretary. The president would of course sign off on any of those appointments, but he wouldn't personally be conducting the press secretary interviews, as he would with the cabinet members. Again, I really wish this game was more of a Plague Inc. style sandbox game, rather than a story driven one. It already has the UI and basic gameplay mechanics down, but it lacks the player freedom. I mentioned the satirical elements earlier, and I wanted to draw a distinction here by pointing out that there are certain more serious moments where you can start to imagine the immense pressure exerted on past and previous commanders-in-chief, whether or not you like them or hate them. Being the commander-in-chief means that you're responsible for basically anything inside or outside the U.S. as relating to the U.S. If it goes wrong, you're the one responsible for managing the situation from there. There are moments here where you have to decide whether or not to negotiate in a hostage situation, how to respond to a school shooting, and whether to commit to a rescue and recovery mission to save the occupants of a military submarine, even if doing so alerts an enemy nation that we've trespassed within their national aquatic borders. It's not a question of if people will die on your watch, it's a matter of how many. There are moments where there are no good outcome. Nothing you can do will prevent innocent lives from being lost. The most you can do is limit the amount of destruction dealt and the number of lives lost, thus serving the needs of the nation while also limiting your liability in the press and in your approval ratings. These moments are another area where the game really begins to shine, but the problem is again you won't be spending the majority of your time dealing with this kind of complexity, but more on petty housekeeping bullshit which is nowhere near as enjoyable. I've criticized a lot of games in the past for being unable to find a fine line between comedy and drama. Oftentimes one ends up superseding the other, sometimes to the point where the latter element feels like an unnecessary distraction due to that imbalance. Tonally, this is the president manages, at least mostly, to find that much desired balance. It stumbles every now and then, but overall it handles this better than most of its contemporaries. I definitely also got the feeling that this is a game that the developer intends to not only push on PC and consoles, but also on mobile devices like iOS and Android. I could very easily see myself playing this on a mobile device. This is the President also has a very pick up and play atmosphere, I found it highly addicting, to the point where I could sit down and play for 2 or 3 hours at a time, at least earlier on when I actually enjoyed what I was playing, which is highly unusual for me as I generally have a very variety based gamer mentality. Here you can play through an entire month of your presidency in easily 5 or 10 minutes, assuming that there aren't a lot of actions to take in that particular month. As far as optimization goes, this is one of those games where by its very design you don't have to worry about whether or not it's going to run well on your current gaming rig, whatever it might be. Odds are if you've got anything better than an Intel integrated graphics card powering your PC, you'll probably run this game perfectly fine. In the roughly 6 hours of footage I recorded for this review, it only ended up taking about 8GB of space on my external hard drive, which is ridiculously low. 
For comparison's sake, when I recorded about four hours of Sniper Elite 5, the third-person open-world sniping game that I'm currently working on a review for, that footage ended up being about 230 gigabytes in size. For those wondering why I'm bringing that up, the ultimate size of the video render is largely dependent on the graphical demand of the game, as well as the amount of activity resulting in the rate of change between frames, in addition to a few other lesser factors. Given that this is a game where not all that much happens from one frame to the next, it makes it a lot easier for budget PCs to run said game. You won't have to spend minutes at a time tweaking graphical settings to your liking here. All you'll have to do is decide whether or not to mute the music or likewise reduce the volume of the sound effects because both can get a bit repetitive at times. Overall, I think it obviously must be said that This Is The President is a very niche game with an equally niche audience. If you enjoy political humor and satire and are looking for something written by people with both a individually and collectively higher average brain cell count than the writers of Saturday Night Live, and you're down for some very easy word puzzles and casual card-based strategy, then This Is The President is definitely the game for you. If that's not the kind of game you're currently interested in, then the odds are nothing about this game in particular will convince you to defect in its favor. So, do with that what you will. At any rate, that's where I'm going to wrap it up for today. As ever, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to click the like button and comment below what you think of the game. Comments really help my videos get boosted in the algorithm, and plus I read and respond to nearly all the comments I get, so even if you want to drop a comment just to say hi or get my opinion on something, even if it's unrelated, I'll be more than happy to chat with you down below. Likewise, subscribing and clicking the bell really helps. I know it's cliche, no one wants to hear it, but YouTube algorithm is a pain in the ass to deal with, doubly so when you're a small channel like I am. This is Warrior Dan signing out. Stay awesome, everybody. Stay safe and peace out. As my thoughts get lost in the wine, a shiver runs down my spine. No more question the name for us both. This place isn't going to be mine or yours. The wind in my hair, love in the air. More than a passion. Now I'm moving. Now I'm moving. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. We just hit a little girl on the road. Can't leave her alone. It's a crime. Should I go behind? Well, we have to find shit. Yeah.